Christopher Balanci. Thank you for joining us today for the second webinar in the TA Network Global Distance Learning Series. As mentioned, I'm Christopher Balanci, and I've been asked to lead this initiative on behalf of the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, or SAMHSA, Center for Mental Health Services, Child, Adolescent, and Family Branch, along with the TA Network. We're excited to offer this first-of-its-kind training series for system of care grantees. The purpose of this clinical series is to identify and provide technical assistance around the latest innovations in child and adolescent clinical interventions. Our goal is that the series will appeal to a broad audience, including youth, families, clinicians, and administrators, allowing all interested stakeholders in your community to gain convenient access to the latest information on best practices in children and adolescents' behavioral health care. We've got a great list of leading experts in the field on deck to provide a multifaceted series of webinars, office hours, and consultation on a variety of topics including established evidence-based practices that are effective in systems of care settings, learning and wisdom from practice-based evidence, and emerging best practices. By now, you should have received a survey asking for your feedback on what you and your community is interested in learning about related to clinical interventions in children's behavioral health. I encourage you, actually urge you, to complete that survey because we're going to be using it to identify future speakers for this clinical distance learning series. Uh, if you didn't receive it, you can also find it in the TA Telegram that went out this Tuesday. Uh, there's a link to the survey. Please complete it for us so that we can make sure that we're including topics that are going to be the most useful and beneficial to you. And we'll keep you updated over the next few months through the TA Telegram about all the upcoming programs that the Clinical Learning Series has to offer. So stay tuned for that. And with that overview on the clinical series, I want to introduce the Early Assessment and Support Alliance at Portland State University. We're thrilled that ESA has agreed to partner with us and present this series. Janet Walker is the lead for the TA Network at Portland State University, and will introduce today's speakers on the topic of mapping experiences of psychosis from onset to recovery. Thanks very much, Chris, and welcome to everyone for today's webinar. Thanks for joining us. Uh, as Chris mentioned, I am the lead here at Portland State University for the Technical Assistance Network for Children's Behavioral Health. And that means that I'm the liaison to several centers and initiatives that we have here at PSU. Um, that includes the Research and Training Center for Pathways to Positive Futures, which works to improve outcomes for older adolescents and young adults with serious mental health conditions. Uh, PSU is also home to the National Wraparound Initiative, uh, the Reclaiming Futures Initiative, and most relevant for today, the ESA Center for Excellence, which provides technical assistance, training, and other forms of support to ESA programs around the state of Oregon and around the nation. ESA programs work with youth and young adults who are experiencing a first episode of psychosis, providing them with the information and support they need to continue on their chosen life path. ESA started out in 2001 in five Oregon counties and has since expanded to a state-level effort. It's been my pleasure to be affiliated with the Center of Excellence's work since it was created at PSU, which is just over a year ago uh, now. And it's also my pleasure today to introduce uh, Dr. Ryan Melton, who is the Clinical Director for the ESA Center for Excellence. Ryan has been working with ESA since uh, it got started and has a wealth of clinical experience with particular focus on early psychosis, uh, practice, training, and research. So with that, I would like to turn it over to Ryan uh, to continue with the webinar. Thanks. Thank you, Janet. Um, hello, everybody. Uh, yeah, this, as Janet mentioned, this is Ryan Melton, and I'm the director of the ESA Center for Excellence. So I'm looking forward to leading this webinar today. Um, so just uh, a reminder that there will be a follow-up call to this webinar on September 23rd from 2 to 3.30 Eastern Time, 11 to 12.30 Pacific Standard Time. I hope to use that time to really get into detail of the specific questions that you may have from, from this webinar. And then a follow-up reminder is that we'll, uh, the third webinar in this series, Transforming Systems of Care for Early Psychosis, a step-by-step -step approach. Uh, presented by Tamara Sale, Dr. Dixon, and Dr. Jones will occur on September 30th with a follow-up call on October 6th. So I hope to have you all there as well. That is me. As, I, as Janet mentioned, I'm director of clinical director of the Early Assessment Support Alliance Center for Excellence at Portland State University's Regional Research Institute. 
But that's not really why you came on here today. What about me? I'm actually interested in who you are. And was there a poll? Yes, okay, good. So if we could take a moment and do a quick vote so I could learn who you are, um, that will help kind of guide the content of, or at least how I talk about the content of my presentation today. Like magic, think about it. Okay. And point one percent program evaluator looks like I forgot one area to add. Maybe we should have added another. Okay, great. Looks like we have a nice diverse uh, group with administrators taking uh, the lead. Uh, but it looks like we've got all of the areas covered, which is great. So we'll be covering um, kind of the roles that uh, everybody plays um, in, an, in an ESA, or sorry, an early psychosis program, at least following the ESA model. All right? Can we move back? Okay, so what we'll be covering today is we'll be talking about early psychosis intervention, specifically how ESA in Oregon um, does early psychosis intervention work. Um, as part of the presentation, I'll be talking about the recognition and diagnosis of psychosis risk syndromes and actual psychosis. You may or may not be uh, aware that um, when we use the term early psychosis in the field, we're oftentimes talking about two different populations. We're talking about those who are at risk of developing psychosis and those who are in the early stages of psychosis. There are slightly different uh, treatment recommendations for these two groups. I feel very fortunate to be part of ESA who covers and treats both, both groups. Um, as part of this, we'll also be talking about post-psychotic adjustments. That would be individuals who have already experienced psychosis and what th that treatment looks like and what their experiences are. Um, how do we engage individuals in early psychosis programs? That seems to be quite key. Without engagement, we're not able to do all these great evidence-based practices. And then I'll get into some detail around, around those best practices um, with early psychosis individuals, including crisis work, cognitive behavioral therapy, motivational interviewing, multifamily psychoeducation, and the list there. And how I plan to talk about each of these areas today it's by using a series of videos from the experts who um, have worked in these specific practices. And then I think I will end with um, kind of how to transition from early psychosis services. So what is ESA? I think uh, Janet did a nice job describing what ESA does. Um, I just want to add that I think we're more than just an early psychosis program, and we really pride ourselves in integrating the voice and strengths of our participants and our, and our families. Um, throughout this webinar, you'll see a series of artwork. All the artwork on, in this webinar series was done by participants or graduates of the ESA program. You'll also see a series of quotes in this webinar, and those quotes are direct quotes from uh, ESA participants. I'll start um, off uh, with, a, with a quote from, uh, or actually a mission statement from our Young Adult Leadership Council. Our Young Adult Leadership Council is made up of graduates and participants of the ESA program, and their job is to kind of guide us and direct us on what kind of is good practice and how we can continue, continue to have kind of culturally appropriate services for adolescents and young adults who are experiencing early psychosis. So their quote is, uniting the voices and strengths of young adults and their allies to create a thriving community and a revolution of hope. I think it's a great quote that really sums up ESA. Um, we are part of the social sphere, trying to be a culturally appropriate uh, program for young adults. So uh, please, when you have a moment, check out our website, a great uh, list of resources. Please follow us on Facebook. We're just under 800 likes right now, and I'd like to see us get up to 800 likes um, around this webinar. We also have Twitter and Tumblr accounts. And again, this artwork is artwork done by, um, uh, by an ESA, ESA participant. Use their description of ESA. Let me talk quickly about our mission of of ESA and a general mission of early psychosis programs around the country. 
we want to keep young people with the early signs of psychosis on a normal life path. How do we do that? We have to make the community aware. Um, or prevention work does prevention does not work if people do not know about it. So you as an early prevention program need to have dedicated time of your staff to be out there talking about what the early warning signs of psychosis are and how to get services quickly, given that we had been one and that, that leads nicely into the next next uh, part of our mission, which is offering that easy, accessible, effective treatment. And we use a public health approach, which means in short, this is not a payer-based eligibility. So individuals, uh, you don't actually have to have a specific payer like, or, like uh, Medicaid or uh, private insurance to be eligible for our services. If you, this is an eligibility-based program, meaning that if you have the signs of early psychosis, you're in, regardless of what payer uh, you may have. And that's absolutely key. If you don't do that, you can miss up to two-thirds of the uh, early psychosis population. Uh, what do we provide? Well, we hopefully to provide a network of educated community members who are aware of early psychosis programs who refer to us quickly as well as clinicians who are specifically skilled in early psychosis work. We use the most current evidence-based practices. We really consider ourselves an iterative model, meaning that we're constantly learning and constantly seeking feedback um, to continue to improve our services. So basically, we've taken a lot of the evidence-based practices and tried to make them culturally sensitive to this particular population. Uh, our, this is the makeup of a early psychosis team, specifically an ESA team. I use the term transdisciplinary. I'll talk more about that in a second. So, I mean, the team should consist of leadership. This is absolutely key. If you don't have good leadership, the programs just don't work. We've actually even written in our practice guidelines directions that administrators should follow to kind of lead an early psychosis program. More of that will be talked about in webinar number three. should have some type of team leader. Um, this might be a person that does the initial screening, the initial assessments um, for eligibility for your early psychosis program. We, need a, we have a prescriber. We have nurses. We have clinical social workers, counselors, psychologists who do most of the clinical work. We've integrated supported employment and supported education. We've inter also integrated occupational therapy. In addition to this map, we've really started to integrate peer support, and that's, that's new for us. So more about that in, in future webinars. Um, the, the model, if there is a clinical model that we follow in ESA, it's a FACT model, which stands for Family Aided Assertive Community Treatment, which basically takes um, elements of the ACT, assertive community, of the ACT model, assertive community treatment, and the family psychoeducation model and puts them together. So it's not, a, they're not full fidelity on either of those models, but it integrates elements of, of those models. And here's what it looks like. It definitely looks like proactive outreach. So you're going to meet, okay, following the key element of ACT, which you're going to meet the client or the participant in whatever environment that they're comfortable. This may not necessarily be an office-based intervention. And you're going to meet with the family or the primary supports of that, of that individual. Sometimes you're going to meet with them even though the client isn't quite ready for service or their illness limits their insight into service. Um, and that, what that might look like is then you're doing crisis planning with the family. Um, and this, this avoids that really unfortunate uh, scenario that currently happens in mental health where someone has to be dangerous or have some life-threatening emergency before, before we can intervene. We at ESA, we want to intervene before that. And, so that might mean just meeting with the family and doing crisis planning or, or advocacy or really looking, trying to find a way to get in to engage, uh, engage the individual in services. We do transdisciplinary treatment planning. Um, that means what that looks like, again, is a very small caseload. Uh, it's a 1 to 10 uh, ratio. And that's, that's, sorry, there's a typo that should read across the team. So it's a 1 to 10 ratio across the team, not across the time. Um, there's a fixed point of screening. That means that there's somebody whose role on the team is to screen for eligibility for the early psychosis program, a definite flexible service delivery model, again, meeting clients wherever, getting very creative in your engagement efforts, basically sometimes bending those standard mental health rules to really engage people in services. Um, and this is a team that meets very frequently, at least weekly, if not twice weekly, to talk about every individual. 
Uh, you should have 24-7 availability. And what that can look like is integration with your crisis system. An example of that would be that your crisis system has detailed information on an individual's crisis plans. So even if your team isn't available 24-7, you're well integrated into your, your local crisis system. This is a quote from a, an ESA participant. I was, I think, highlighting that it's different for everyone. Everybody has their own way to express themselves. Letting that be a way to segue into different ways that ESA can provide services. If someone would have told me about OT or art therapy, I would have said, OK, I'll give it a try. If they have told me about counseling, I would have said, get out of here, which means in some ways our traditional mental health service approach is still kind of holds a stigmatizing approach. So we, we need to kind of be very flexible in how we introduce services to, to people. And the FACT model allows for that. Some of you might be wondering about the term transdisciplinary versus multidisciplinary and interdisciplinary. This was developed by Bruder in 1994. The difference between transdisciplinary and a multidisciplinary team, and multidisciplinary by definition just means multiple disciplines working on a, a, the same individual. Transdisciplinary is multiple disciplines working with the same individual who have a very shared treatment plan, and oftentimes you'll share roles and cross, cross professional boundaries. It doesn't mean that a social worker may be prescribing, but it does mean that a social worker, counselor, psychologist may have really good information on side effects and maybe talking to clients about that. It also might mean that your support employment uh, specialist might do a little bit of case management. It's basically get, get the need done and share responsibility across the team. So it, it, it means there's a continuous give and take. There's a common treatment goal. And what this usually results in is less contact with a person overall by individual team members, but more contact as a team. So it's really looking at this as a very much a team approach that there isn't just a lead ESA or lead early psychosis clinician that any clinician across the team could kind of act as lead, but really the team is the lead. Okay, let's start getting into uh, the assessment phase. How do we recognize psychosis? How do we recognize those who are eligible for ESA services? One thing to uh, of course recognize is that psychosis in and of itself is common. And that you know psychosis may exist in about three out of 100 individuals or so. But schizophrenia is, is quite rare, uh, with an instant, instant rate about one in 10,000. And where early psychosis programs tend to focus is on schizophrenia psychosis, and in, in a lot of cases the bipolar disorder psychosis or psychosis associated with bipolar disorder or the other affective psychoses associated with with depressive disorders. Um, but psychosis occurs in a wide range of conditions. It can uh, occur in obsessive compulsive disorder, um, autism spectrum disorders. Um, I think you're probably all aware that psychosis exists with substance use or abuse, medical illnesses, trauma, post-traumatic stress disorder, and psychotic-like experiences. Part of our role uh, as early psychosis programs is to really help ferret that out early so we can and get accurate diagnoses so, again, we then can offer accurate and the most appropriate form of treatment. For our early, for our at-risk psychosis individuals, we really do want to catch people before psychosis even starts um, so that, so we really educate the community on what, what some of those early warning signs are, which could be things like feeling that something's not right, confusion, trouble speaking, being fearful for no good reason, hearing sounds, voices that are not there. And, and you'll look at these symptoms and you'll think, well, that kind of sounds like your typical adolescent. Um, true, but we'll also be looking at changes and several of these changes um, that are also uh, that are also resulting in functional decline would result in a good referral referral to ESA or an early psychosis program. The idea is that psychosis occurs on a spectrum. Let's take three common psychotic symptoms like grandiosity, suspiciousness, or auditory hallucination. At the lowest level, uh, let's take grandiosity, a um, young person may talk about wanting to enjoy basketball, and although it may be an average basketball uh, player, thinks they're going to attend a Division I college on a, on, a full, on a full scholarship. That in and of itself, not psychosis, and may in some ways be part of the normal spectrum. But as psychosis moves, if we get to the full range of, of psychosis, that's when the, the youth, the young person, is headed to New York City because he believes he's talented enough to join the, join the Knicks and, and the fact that, that he's not. Where ESA and early psychosis programs really want to try to catch people is right in the middle of, of each of these spectrums. Um, we, don't want, we definitely don't want to 
over uh, over diagnose and catch people early to know when there really isn't a, a, a problem, but we, we try to prevent from hitting that full psychosis. So one way we do that is using the psychosis risk syndrome scale or the structured interview for psychosis risk uh, syndromes, which Barbara Walsh will be talking to you about in just one second or so, a few seconds. Here's a series of questions that we would be asked uh, using the SIPs. Um, the SIPs then will measure ratings on each of these uh, psychotic symptoms. And then other areas that we pay attention to in addition to just the presence of pre-psychotic symptoms is significant deterioration in functioning. Uh, you know, so this unexplained decrease in work or school performance, this inability to concentrate as well, decrease in personal hygiene. Um, reduction in stress tolerance. And then a big one we, we look for is kind of uh, individuals for no good reason or no explainable reason, at least that we're aware of, that they're withdrawing from their, from their normal community. So each of these uh, uh, positive symptoms is rated on a zero to six scale, zero being it's not there at all, six being severe and psychotic. Um, if you score in the three, four, five area, um, we consider that at psychosis risk. Obviously, a six would be someone who is already past that psychotic uh, threshold. And really, the big difference between a five and a six, um, in short, is, is, is insight or the ability to really talk about their symptoms as maybe a condition or that the symptoms are guiding their behavior in a way that's potentially harmful. So here's just a more details on what would help on the P2 scale, which is suspiciousness scale, on what would get you a 5 versus a 6. And again, Barbara Walsh is going to go into a lot more detail on this right now. So Adam, if you could load up Barbara's video.
Adam, it looks like I'm having some difficulty scrolling forward to the next sec to the next slide. And I've got this gray uh, over my screen, so I can't, it's hard for me to read. Sorry, what was that? I, I can't I can't read the slides. There's a gray kind of uh, cover over it right now. And I have a box that reads no matching videos. I'm still unable to control the uh, slideshow. Sorry, folks. Okay. Um, okay. Looks like we're we're up and going again. Uh, so then, anyway, that was uh, Barbara Walsh, who does the primary training on the uh, SIPS on the SIPS scale. So again, as a reminder, um, it, that uh, ESA, as an early psychosis program, engages both individuals in the, this pre-psychotic stage or this at-risk stage, which is identified by the SIPS, and then for an end first episode individuals, people who have kind of gone to that that psychotic reached that kind of psychotic threshold. Um, one thing that we really try hard to understand is what is that early psychosis experience, that's the kind of uh, pre-episode or sorry, post-episode experience like. One of our partners in understanding that is Dr. Mary Moeller, who wrote this article, so I'm giving her some plug for this particular article. This article was written uh, based on experiences of, of, ESA, of ESA participants. And what, um, what Dr. Moeller describes is similar to Davidson's model of recovery from schizophrenia, that uh, as somebody is kind of developing a psychotic illness, we, there's these symptoms that uh, are, are quite subtle, similar to that uh, that Barbara described with the SIFs, this increasing withdrawal and isolation. And there's these internal experiences like with, that uh, consist of demoralization and despair, all of it kind of, and, and cognitive intrusions and disruptions, all of it kind of resulting in this decline in functioning. And this decline in functioning sometimes happens before the, the presence of positive psychotic symptoms. Um, so it's easy to misinterpret it as, as something else because the, the individual may not significant or not specifically complain of hearing voices or believing unusual things, but are still experiencing what's resulting in, in uh, early disability. As somebody starts to move through the recovery process, through moving into that post-psychotic adjustment, you know, they'll get a sense, uh, we, our, our goal is to help to develop a sense of belonging and hope, uh, facilitate successes, pleasures, enhance a sense of agency and belonging. However, um, with each of those developments, um, the presence of failure, stigma, and rejection can result or can occur and results in the individual going back into those early early experiences. So Dr. Moeller um, developed a a, uh, a model uh, described as MAP that kind of helps us understand what those kind of adjustment phases are like and what intervention may be helpful during each each of these uh, these pre psychotic adjust or sorry post psychotic adjustment phases. It's comprised of four different phases. The first stage is that cognitive dissonance stage, or what uh, Dr. Moeller describes as on the couch. And I'm going to give her an opportunity in, in a video in a second to talk more about that. These particular slides are just to give you a reference, at least a uh, written reference, of what each of the phases are. The next stage is gaining insight, or what she'll describe as at the bus depot. The, st the third stage um, is starting to achieve that cognitive constant consistency, which is that uh, uh, she also described that as being at the mall. Um, and then ultimately it results in reestablishing ordinary or kind of keeping the, or going back onto that uh, life path, which she describes as back to work. 
some of the subjective experiences that were reported by ESA clients as they were going through this phases were frustration. So the quote, the math that was, it's overwhelming when your brain's not working because you count on your brain to tell you on what's going on in the world and when your brain's not working. And it says things that aren't there, then that's like you can't, you don't make good decisions about anything. Taking too much energy. It takes energy. It feels like it's never going to end. It just keeps going. I had trouble concentrating and trouble getting up and reading and stuff. And part of me was hoping there was no appointments for that day, you know? So again, some of these early, uh, these adjustment symptoms and even early symptoms have nothing, of, have very little to do with these positive symptoms. More have to do with kind of self, uh, self-efficacy, concentration, um, energy. Constructive use of time. So this would be someone kind of moving through the phases. It's important to have things to do. There will be times I'll, I'll be around here. I'll, I'll either have too much to do or absolutely nothing to do. And I'll just walk, kind of walk around in circles through the house. I'll do that two or three times and realize I need to do something, something to do. And I'm just wasting time and looking like a fool or, or whatever. And next, kind of moving through, being honest with reality. I've had to learn to, to listen to other people a bit. Sometimes instead of always just going off on your own thinking, not everybody knows what's best for you, but some people do know a lot more than others. I've had a good friend of mine who, when I said that I thought my phones were tapped or something, he said, why would they be paying attention to you? How are you that significant? So to find people that you trust and who to give, that, give you that, those bits of wisdom. Next, I want to move into uh, the video with Mary Moeller to kind of go into this map process in a little more detail, and hopefully I'll know what to do this time.
given uh, what these early symptoms look like with um, in an early psychosis uh, presentation, and then what these kind of post symptoms look like when someone's experienced a psychotic a psychotic episode, and kind of the cultural and developmental nature of young adults and adolescents, one thing I really encourage early psychosis programs to do is to is to think about some of those typical mental health assumptions and rules that people have to follow to get into services and get rid of them, or at least think about them differently. Like here are some of the rules that I think we need to change. We, we need to change this idea that people need to be 100% compliant with meds and 100% abstinent from illicit drugs. Remember, this is a, these are symptoms in which are, that are they're treated by medications that have significant side effects. And you're also working with a group that doesn't really want to be ill and doesn't really identify themselves as ill. And sometimes their symptoms aren't something they really see as, as, as illness-related symptoms, but just symptoms are kind of progressing through. And, and you're working with, some, at some cases, 19 to 25-year-olds. And in some ways, I feel it's, it's almost um, impossible to really kind of push in a complete abstinence model. We have to get rid of this idea that people need to accept the illness. People don't need to accept their illness to, and to improve. They need to kind of have goals, and then we as clinicians need to accept that, or put more focus on functioning outcomes, as Mary suggests, versus reduction of, of symptoms. I know I have a supervisor, and you uh, supervisors have probably told your clinicians to not work harder than your clients, but this is a group that really, really struggles, and they struggle with these significant cognitive uh, challenges that, that are very hard to recognize. And sometimes I think we do have to work a little bit harder to kind of engage and to create a system that's comfortable for them to engage in. Um, this is a group that changes their mind a lot. So this idea that we have to close people after not after missing so many appointments, it doesn't work. For those of you who are parents um, out there of, of adolescents, I'm pretty sure that your adolescent has changed their mind from time to time. We need to create a, a clear exit from the system, not, not that this, uh, this symptom, that we need to kind of stop focusing on stability, but more focus on recovery. And sometimes recovery means recovering from the system itself. ESA and a lot of early psychosis programs around the country are time limited, and maybe they're two years, maybe they're five years. And the goal of that is to help people not, or to kind of send a message. You're not anchored in the system, that you can recover. You can get out of the system. And of course, recovery looks different to everybody. We need to stop getting this idea that we need to stick to our, our specific disciplines and really share responsibilities um, across the team. Therapists should be doing case management. Support employment occasionally do case management um, in engaging in, in different ways. We've got to lose this idea that we need to maintain strict boundaries with clients. It means we have to kind of, one thing that we found in, in our studies, as well as studies with mental health clinicians in a wide range of, of locations, is that one thing that clients find most helpful is a little bit of self-disclosure from the clinician. And, but yet, um, clinicians really struggle with, with self-disclosure. So we have to challenge ourselves in that way. We have to get rid of this idea that just some people can't be helped. Some people will need a lot of help. And people have asked me, they say, Ryan, do you really believe every person that goes through ESA can get better? And I say yes, but sometimes they need two hands being held the whole time. And that kind of goes back to you might have to work a little bit harder than your client. Um, adolescents and adults shouldn't be in the same, it should be in different systems. I mean, given that schizophrenia strikes around 16, 17, it really doesn't make a ton of sense to start them in one system and then move them right into another adult system. I really encourage early psychosis systems to have a very consistent and uh, uh, continuous uh, program. In ESA, all of our clinicians are trained to work with both adolescents and adults, and they keep the same clinicians regardless of their age. Um, we, we might work behind the scenes to switch them from adult to child, but to the, for the client experiences is no change. And then, of course, this idea that families are, are a barrier to treatment. We need families. We need that. Uh, that, um, that extra social support kind of the therapist in the field. So the whole idea is integrating families into treatment very early. So what, what I'm really trying to change is this image that uh, people see when they enter the mental health system. Um, this the person at the front desk saying, I'm sorry, but you need to go back through intake because you didn't fill out this paperwork correctly. Um, we want people to really have a very comfortable way of, of entering our system. And what that might mean is changing the rules a little bit. 
So we encourage really kind of the use of motivational interviewing. And one strategy that I really appreciate is Xavier Amador's LEAP model. And if you have not read, I'm not sick, I don't need help, I strongly encourage you to read that text. It's a very easy read. And he explains in, in uh, some level of detail uh, this kind of this engagement approach, which he calls LEAP, stands for Listen, Empathize, Agree, and Partnership. This is just kind of a, a, a resource um, that could be available to you. It, it really, when I read it, 12 years ago, it really changed the way I thought about engaging um, individuals in, with psychosis. So we do need to focus more on engagement, and that engagement needs to occur before the treatment intervention. So we've got to find ways to put people at ease, and that might mean meeting them in the community. That might mean um, meeting in a Starbucks, um, meeting wherever is comfortable. It may mean that we stop the face-to-face -face counseling approach, but the side-by-side -side counseling approach I'm struck by a, st uh, a story of a client that I work with with significant negative symptoms where his mom really wanted to engage in counseling with me. And as we did counseling, we'd sit and stare at each other for 60 minutes, something uncomfortable for him and uncomfortable for me. One day, his mom calls me and says, hey, uh, I can't give my son a ride home. Could you give him a ride home? I say, sure. I give him a ride home. And on our way home, as we're listening to music, we engage in the most fruitful conversation that we've ever had. And I've been seeing him in individual therapy for three, three or four months. Is there something about that eye-to-eye -eye contact that was very uncomfortable? So I, I really kind of encourage that side-to-side -side talking or engaging in therapy while playing basketball. Actually, I've got, had great therapy sessions while playing video games with people. You're going to hear things said that are, un, are uncomfortable or unusual from individuals who are experiencing psychotic symptoms. It's, I think, one one challenge that we have is that we try to engage in the writing reflexes is we say, oh, this is part of your mental illness, and that's, that's a symptom, when really it might work better to acknowledge what they're saying, acknowledge the feeling around what they're saying. So when somebody says, hey, I'm worried that this, there's a computer chip in my brain, they're saying, well, that's a symptom of your mental illness, perhaps saying something like, it's got to be really scary to have a computer chip in your brain. Tell me about how that got there. So always try to be flexible, active, helpful, Spend time socializing. Remember that one of these early symptoms is social withdrawal. One of probably the best or one of the early symptoms is social withdrawal. So maybe one of the best interventions is engaging in socialization. Uh, remember that those cognitive deficits are present. So if you are going to do uh, some kind of homework, for example, make sure you write it down. Um, we know that people without psychotic ex experiences forget 80% of what their doctor says the moment they leave the appointment. So it's really important to kind of write things down to be send very kind of clear instructions. And if you can, and we can with ESA, is that we, we don't have to do all this kind of mental health assessment stuff up front. We can focus more on strengths assessment. Um, let people tell their stories. And even as they're telling their stories, you're, you're gathering information that can, that can help fill in your assessment. So it is a, a different approach to entering a mental health. Um, this client says, I would highlight that as far as therapy goes, it's really non-traditional. Mental health consultants with ESA aren't going to sit with you in the office. They're going to meet you where you need to be met, whether it's in your home or an easy hike. They do some amazing things with clients. So why do we focus so much on engagement? And, there, and I think there's three reasons why we focus on, on engagement. One is when someone reaches that psychotic threshold or that six on the SIPs, they lose insight. Um, in the medical world, we call that anosognosia, um, which basically is a medical term that, that, that says that a client no longer recognizes their symptom. Um, in the stroke world, uh, a, a stroke physician may ask uh, a, a client to pick up a pen with their right hand. And if that client doesn't do it, they recognize it. They recognize that that's the two, two halves of the brain not communicating with each other. If we ask a client to do something and they say no, we call it noncompliance when, in fact, it may be a symptom of their condition. 50, or between 40 and 50 percent of individuals with schizophrenia, schizoaffective disorder, and bipolar disorder with psychosis don't think they have that condition. So we, we kind of start to engage in this paradigm where we want to force people to accept an illness that they often don't believe that they have. And then, and what we're wanting to them to accept is probably the most stigmatizing condition out there. So we want them to accept an illness they don't think they have that's also quite stigmatizing. And then we tell them that this illness that they don't think they have is also stigmatizing. The best way to treat that is to use a pill that's going to cause significant side effects like weight gain. And so we send them this message, and when they say no, I can't believe that we sometimes have the nerve to say, 
you're being non-compliant or they lack insight. I think sometimes this lack of insight means they don't agree with us. So we really have to change how we engage with, with individuals. One way to do that is the use of cognitive therapy for psychotic symptoms. It's a well-researched um, um, treatment model, substantial positive effects. There are unfortunately few published therapy manuals, and it's practiced uh, mostly outside of the United States. That's probably due to the strong biological bias that we have in this country, but is a standard of practice in the UK and in Australia. There's a good evidence base for, uh, for use of, using a combo of cognitive therapy and medications. Some of the results result in uh, individuals not uh, being able to use less medicines uh, when they're also using cognitive therapy. And there's some case study reports that show cognitive therapy is helpful for individuals who aren't using med medication. The idea with cognitive therapy uh, in psychosis is that the help is not an absent of disruptive emotions or it's not an absent of disruptive symptoms. Um, it's health is rather a balance between what's disruptive and what is stabilizing. It kind of acknowledges that the symptoms that the individual is experiencing may have some meaning in their lives. So there's the cognitive approach integrates itself with motivational interviewing. The goals are very structured, but they're structured around what the client wants. So, and, and oftentimes what the client wants is not a reduction of symptoms, but an increase in functioning. So we'll often ask the question, if these symptoms that you're describing were present, what would you be doing? And if they say something like, well, I'd be hanging out with my friends more or working, that becomes our goal. So goal is always kind of future focused um, or additive versus a reduction of symptoms. And how we do that is engaging in this collaborative empiricism, which involves asking questions about their experiences versus challenging their experiences as being irrational. So you're trying to find that middle ground of, of you're not um, confronting them on their symptoms, but you're not colluding either. You're trying to find meaning in those symptoms. Um, and this is done through Socratic dialogue and avoiding the role of excerpt, uh, expert and having curiosity about the client's effort to make sense, using empathy and a little bit of self-disclosure. Like, I, I would also feel scared if I believed that there was a, 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 a brain or a computer chip in my brain. So again, the cognitive model is trying to find that that balance. It's not the shame and blame model, the model that says, hey, you've chosen to be like this, and you could get over it if you just pulled yourself up by your bootstraps or if you worked harder. But it's not the medical model either, the medical model being that you have a brain disease or some biochemical imbalance that you aren't responsible for, and you have no decision in this. And the, the, you know, I, I appreciate the medical model at times can reduce stigma, but it also can send a message that you, because you have no responsibility and this is completely outside of you, when our treatments don't work, such as our medications, then that sends a message to the individual that, that they're flawed and they can't be fixed. And we have to be very careful with that message. So we prefer the cognitive model, which is that you're not to blame for falling into this problematic pattern. You didn't know enough to anticipate it, but with effort and us working together, um, you can get over it or get out of it, sorry. All right, and that's gonna, I'm going to insert a video of me doing some cognitive behavioral therapy for psychosis. Can't promise it's my best work. It was kind of done on the fly, but none of us are perfect at this.
I think it's important as a presenter to sometimes put yourself out there and kind of engage in um, well, kind of a eat what you cook, so to speak. So I can't promise that well, it was my best work, but it was done on the fly. And what you noticed in that video, at least what I hope you noticed, is that I didn't challenge uh, this participant's belief system in any type of medical model way. I, can, I just simply explored it with him. And when he talked through it, he came up with his own coping skill uh, versus me telling him, well, if you just took your medicines, it, you, would, you would feel better. Moving on to other treatment elements, I would be remiss to not talk about substance use or the role of kind of dual diagnosis. Obviously, we know that there's a high rate of substance use with individuals who have psychotic disorders. And we also know that young adults and adolescents is kind of part of their culture. Substance use or substance misuse is, is part of the practice. But, so a couple of key tips in kind of integrating dual diagnosis or substance-related um, treatment, substance-related disorders treatment. Um, into your early psychosis program practice. You have to remember you're working with adolescents and young adults, and that sometimes use is kind of part of that. And we have to probably separate what would be considered normal developmental use uh, versus um, an actual substance use disorder, um, and not completely overreacting to if a 21-year-old goes out and gets drunk on, on, their, on their birthday. Um, we also um, want to kind of pay attention to that marijuana is becoming much more frequently used. And I know in the state of Oregon, it's likely to be legal um, in the next year or so. So we're going to have to be kind of talking about that um, in a different way than, than we have before. I know um, some of our clinicians, when uh, uh, clients are using marijuana and they're claiming it's a part of their medicine, we have a kind of pretty loose um, med medical marijuana laws here, here in Oregon. We say, okay, well, if it's a medicine, let's then monitor symptoms versus kind of shaming them um, for, for using the substance or giving them a whole bunch of warning about it. Saying, okay, well, if it's a medicine, let's see if it actually works. Let's monitor symptoms in the same way that we would monitor if you were taking an antipsychotic medication. Other things to pay attention to, you have to ask yourself, is it really a dual diagnosis? Is this or is that their drug use really causing their symptoms? And that comes at assessment. We really want to get treatment right. So we want to be careful not to mislabel what's really a substance-induced psychotic disorder as a major mental illness like schizophrenia or bipolar disorder. The treatment looks very different. We have to be a little careful with overusing the term clients are using for self-medication. There isn't actually a lot of research to support the METS, the self-medication hypothesis. So you want to think about it, how the dual diagnosis model thinks about it, which is people generally use to reduce discomfort, but not necessarily as a self-medication thing. They're not necessarily using it to treat an illness. They might use it to help sleep. But most of the studies suggest that people generally use, particularly young people, generally use when they're in good moods. So working with the individual and normalizing in some ways their use, what you were using because you were nervous about going to that party versus you were using to reduce your anxiety disorder. And that's kind of a different message. But of course, either way, inter integrate substance use um, disorders uh, treatment into your, your treatment program. Use a harm reduction approach, motivational interviewing. And the other thing is reverse rehabilitation. Don't put up barriers uh, for people when they're, when they're using. You know, so don't tell them that they're not ready to go to work or not ready to engage in other forms of treatment until they're sober. Not a lot of research to support that, that form of model either. We've actually found that when we support people going to work, even though they're using, they actually stop, reduce their use because they're doing something that takes up their time. I mean, I think you read, if you think back to that quote earlier, I mean, when you have nothing to do, Sometimes um, using is, is, is something. I'm going to uh, enter a, a, have you watch a video now that kind of demonstrates kind of the mistakes that we make when kind of working with substances. I apologize for the gender, gender stereotypes that, that occur uh, in, in this video.
like, so I hope you see the message in that particular video. You can insert um, anything to replace that nail. I mean, it's so easy for us to say, if you just stopped using, uh, you, you, your life would be better. Or if you just took your pills, life would be better. But really, we, the, the key in, in kind of motivational interviewing and uh, talking to therapy, uh, with, whether it be working with substance use or working with somebody around their symptoms, is trying to understand their experience. And we do that with empathy. And rationale emerges out of that empathy and, and dialogue versus um, our direct intervention. I mean, if we could just tell people to stop, our jobs would be a whole lot easier. Uh, moving on, uh, kind of another key element in early psychosis work is the idea of relapse uh, prevention. Um, and relapse prevention it involves helping clients kind of identify these early triggers and past relapses and warning signs of an impending relapse. Now, Relapse means different things to different clients, so it's important as you're working with clients to identify what they specifically define as a relapse. Um, one thing we, we encourage in our fidelity is that every client has some form of relapse prevention plan. And of course, there's a be clients that are now kind of engaged in your, in your therapeutic process. So clients learn how to develop these plans to prevent relapse. Here's a quote from one of our ESA participants. A relapse prevention sheet was made, and I was able to see the early triggers and the next signs. So visually, I was able to see if I decided not to take my medication to see what happens. So in this case, I, the clinician kind of said, well, if you, it's up to you whether you want to stop your medication, but let's look, what might, let's look at some of the things that may come back. If they do, then we can respond. If they don't, then, you know, we can, we can keep moving forward. The next, uh, this is an example of what a relapse prevention plan might look like. We use, uh, we're generally using either the, uh, the forms from the, the Navigate Manual or the Illness Management Recovery Manual. So we uh, will have clients talk about what are the reminders of events or situations that triggered a relapse in the past. And again, relapse is defined however they define it. What are those early warning signs? What they should do if those early warning signs are present? Who can assist them? And then if it gets to an emergency, moves into that crisis plan, that the relapse prevention plan didn't work, what should we do? The next video is uh, one of our ESA clinicians um, talking about a relapse prevention plan well, with a participant and their mother.
So what you saw on, on that video, at least again what I hope you saw, is that you know, the idea of text messaging changing changes as a potential early warning sign was very unique to that family and that individual. Shane wouldn't have got to that unless he spoke to spoke to the family. Because um, you're never going to see in one of your social work or psychology textbooks, pay attention to text messages as it might be an early warning sign. It's just very, very unique. So we need to spend that time to engage the individuals to understand what their subjective experiences of relapse are, and then also what the family's experiences of relapse are. Another way we engage families is the use of multifamily psychoeducation groups. Um, this is that evidence-based practice with international recognition as a primary treatment for early psychosis, very good outcomes with early psychosis, particularly functional outcomes. A lot of studies are suggesting people who engage in multifamily groups have better vocational and educational outcomes. We follow Dr. McFarlane's model. You spend time joining with all families and really encouraging attendance of these groups. And if they can't make the groups, you do the same model at an individual level. And part of the model is that you offer quarterly workshops. That act, so every three months or so, you do a full day or half day workshop on your program, symptoms of psychosis, treatment, et cetera. You teach all your families the family guidelines. And these uh, family guidelines are, again, modified from the standard evidence-based practice of multifamily psychoeducation to integrate both individuals who are at an at-risk stage of psychosis and those with first episode. You know, you, it, once uh, you kind of get people joined and engage the groups, you, your, your first group, when you meet with people for the first time, you, uh, you do socialization. Sorry, those are a little bit out of order. You do a, a socialization group. You have fun. You don't even talk about the condition. You just, again, you're trying to teach that, that social or, or compensate for that social withdrawal, that, that symptom that occurs for people in the early stages of psychosis. And then also a family's experience also because of their own stigma, that they're not socializing with other people. So one of the, 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 tree, the key components of this model is spending time having fun. Then you move on to kind of the impact of the situation, um, what, how being referred to the early psychosis program or maybe a hospitalization or the symptoms have impacted back to the family. And you share your own experiences as well. That's the disclosure piece. From there, it's the multifamily groups follow a very structured approach. And we spend, we'll spend a lot of time doing our multifamily group trainings and have you practice this approach over and over again. But it, it basically follows a standard problem-solving method, which have people check in, you pick a problem, you do pros and cons, and you do a very detailed plan about what's, what next, what's next. I've talked a lot about functional kind of outcomes. And one way that we kind of get functional outcomes uh, is to really focus or, or have targeted interventions that really are geared towards functional outcomes like vocational and educational outcome. So we've decided to implement the supported employment, supported education model of individual placement and support. Here are those particular principles that work really great with early psychosis because it follows that reverse rehabilitation model. It's open to anybody who wants to work. It doesn't matter how symptomatic they are or if they're using drugs. You, you basically kind of help people find work kind of right away. Some ways to augment or kind of modify IPS for early psychosis means you're going to offer more help with educational goals, not just vocational goals. To keep clients open um, in this system, even though because goals change. So if they say, I don't want to work right now, you still keep them open. You wouldn't close them. Because as you know, young people's minds change quite a bit. You engage the support employment person, kind of follows that transdisciplinary approach that allows them to kind of do other practices like lead multifamily groups, given that multifamily group in combination with support employment gets very good vocational outcomes, better than support employment alone. And of course, using youth-friendly modes of communication, um, meaning that you don't have to go to an employer as you're implementing this model and say, hey, I'm working with someone with mental illness. You can say, hey, I'm working with a young person who's trying to get their first job. It's a much different message. Both are, both are true. Um, and, so, and oftentimes, young people don't want to disclose, about, uh, disclose their illness and oftentimes are stigmatized by even the titles of our vocational services. We've had many clients in our early psychosis program say they didn't want to go to vocational rehabilitation because of the term rehabilitation. And they didn't want to use the disability services office at their local college because of the term disability. So we really have to be cognizant and aware of that. Some studies on IPS outcomes. 
one thing we're not doing as good of a job is kind of educational outcomes, no difference from the control, but a big difference from the control when it was IPS versus kind of standard um, uh, vocational practices for early psychosis. I'm going to hear Gary Bond, uh, who's one of the founders of IPS, tell us a little bit more about this model.
So I'm becoming aware of our time. And so what I would like to do, I'm going to move to the end of my presentation. OK. Um, and I will do some follow-up at our, our question call or our follow-up call. I'll, I'll hit um, in a little more detail some of the areas that we were, weren't able to get to today, like you know, psychopharmacology, nursing, occupational uh, therapy. So I'll be sure to hit those on our follow-up call. So I look forward to having you uh, join us there. Um, I do have some homework for you. Um, if there was something that you'd like me to go into more detail on, or you have a specific question, uh, please email me directly, um, and I will answer that, or come prepared with that question in our follow-up call if you can't attend that. Um, I would like you to follow us on one of our social networks and post a comment. Um, tell, tell, uh, ask a question. Let, let me know what more information um, that you need. Um, if you have a moment, I'd also like you to watch this particular YouTube video linked here. And tell me, uh, you know, watch the video and, and tell me what skills were used to help in the situation and how do those skills and traits relate to early psychosis intervention work? And of course, provide me with feedback on the presentation, whether that be kind of some of around the technical difficulties we have or, or you know, other information that would be more helpful to you. Um, you can access, we will have this uh, webinar available on our website, so you can access it there or share it with your team there. We'll also be providing handouts, tip sheets, and the full video links will be posted over time on our, on our website. I want to give a special thanks to my clinical research assistant, Ellie Taylor. She made a lot of this presentation come together, organized the videos. She's currently interning with an ESA program. She'll be graduating soon and would be an awesome employee if you are looking for one in your early psychosis program. So there's a link to her LinkedIn page. Uh, you will not go wrong with uh, hiring Ellie. So special thanks to Ellie for helping me put this all together. And this is how you can reach me. And again, feel free to contact me, direct me directly via my email if you um, have some uh, direct follow-up follow questions. Um, if you have a cell phone with a QR scan, you can scan the QR uh, read a scan right now, and that will take you right to our website. Um, again, I look forward to the follow-up call and going into a little bit more detail and answering your specific questions. I really appreciate um, your time.